everybody, and welcome to Geek Storm. I'm Sean Hilton, owner of Comics Cube, founder of the Kokomo Con, and I do some other stuff too that doesn't get me into too much trouble and people Lies. sometimes like. Today I'm joined by my good friend Michael Allen Harrison, and we're going to discuss things related to some teaser trailers, Oscars, comics, and other fun and exciting things that I am sure is going to appeal to you. So don't uh, don't turn that dial, don't flip that switch. What? Don't even turn off that app. You've already sat through a commercial to see it. Hey, speaking of commercials, when you're visiting Kokomo with your family from out of town, and you're looking for some family, family-friendly bonding kind of stuff, stop by Geek Street in the beautiful heart of downtown Kokomo. Located, well, right in the heart of downtown Kokomo. You said that already. Right there, 111 East Sycamore, you're gonna find Indiana and the Midwest, if not the entire planet's most wondrous toy store. Kokomo Toys and Collectibles. Right next door to them, you're gonna find um, Indiana's uh, finest record store. Sure, American Hi-Fi. Uh, American Hi-Fi. And then next to them, Chapter Two Books, which is a used bookstore. And then right down, uh, three doors down, you're gonna find my establishment, Comics Cubed. And then if you go wandering around our square, you're gonna find Kingdom Cards and Games, where you can find a game of Magic the Gathering on Friday night. So much room for activities. So amazing. You know what? Mm. Kokomo. Mm. It's happening. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Don't. Yeah. Don't. <laughs> so, we got a lot of stuff going on, but uh, first, as always, we try to cover some of the important things, such as the deaths of uh, <clears throat> notable figures. And I know of at least two. Um, what, uh, who, who, anybody passed away that you'd like to acknowledge? Uh, we didn't really talk about Kirk Douglas. That's, um, that's one of the two. That's a, that's a big one. Probably the, uh, the biggest one, anyway. Well, that's He's a star. Hey, yeah, he's a he's a he's a legend. He's an icon. He's a Doug, Douglas dead. One hundred and three was it? I don't something that, like that. I, is that yeah. the number I saw? Yeah, good for him. Spartacus mm -hmm. has uh, has finally passed away. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. one, the only, and uh -huh. not only is he a golden age uh, acting legend who mm -hmm. you know was busy right up until I don't know the eighties. Sure. Um, but also the proud father of Michael Douglas. Right. A lineage that uh, has produced some amazing. Oscar-winning and talented mm -hmm. uh, talent, right, right in front of the screen. There. I mean, do you have a, a favorite Kirk Douglas uh, role? I'm gonna say no because, well, he okay. He was in some movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, where Schwarzenegger played like this cartoony Western dude in a beautifully pressed, clean thing, and he was the, was it called the villain? Was that the name of the show? And Kirk Douglas was the villain in this, okay. and he was it was typical old old Western looking stuff. And I think uh, Anne Margaret was the was the was the the heroine, which I, that really turned me on to Anne Margaret. That that particular movie right there. And this was uh, probably in the late '70s, early '80s. Um, that's that's the only thing I really remember him in. I know he's been in tons of stuff that I've probably seen back and forth, but that's all I remember him being in. Okay. Kirk Douglas dead. <laughs> what else? Who else died? Robert Conrad. Oh yeah. American James Bond of the old west. He's uh, one of my all-time favorites. <clears throat> Start in that, as well as um, Baba Black Sheep. Uh, not uh, yeah, I was gonna say something from Bellario, Bellarios. Go created Magnum PI. He also created that. He had a whole run of stuff during the mm -hmm. '70s through the '80s, and uh, Baba Black Sheep or Black Sheep Squadron, as it uh, was right, later renamed for certain things, starred him as. Uh, Pilot type character, but sure. enjoyed that. I actually watched a bunch of those. Mm -hmm. And if you ever watch that, um, several of the major characters then go on to be in Magnum. Mm -hmm. TC's in it. Um, the guy who's in the first season, little little pudgy dude, and then goes on to Tales of the Gold Monkey. He's in it. There's a blonde guy who shows up as a naval uh, guy several times as a reoccurring kind of role. So mm -hmm. he uh, he definitely recast a lot of his people, and so but. So Robert Conrad, for me, Wild Wild West, but also a lot of films, things of that nature. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, classic uh, actor. And just a ruggedly handsome, good looking sure. kind of uh, of dude. You know, I could see a lot of people back in the day were like, you know, I want to go to the barber, I want his hair. I want to look like this guy <laughs> kind of thing. So just, uh, yeah, he had a good look to him. Sure, so. sure. Yeah. You sound enamored. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot worse people to, you know, maybe, uh, Want to look like, I suppose. Sure. I go, yeah, I'll go with Robert Conrad in the in the day. Mm -hmm. So, anybody else? What do you got? Um, no other deaths that I know of. Okay. I'm sure there are plenty. Very cool. All right. <laughs> they are cool. <laughs> They're all dead. Sorry about your luck. What can we say? 
What's up? <laughs> What are you doing? What are you doing over there? The Kokomo toys. I'm kind of looking at some of these. Oh, there's so many toys. I get a little. So you know, many like toys. Some of this cool, <clears throat> cool stuff. And so many uh, toys. Like there's, I mean, I don't even know what that is. Toonie Terrors. Mm -hmm. They're like cutesy, fun cartoon versions of Leatherface and Pennywise over here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it draws me in. It's great. I think it's pretty awesome. There's so much to see here. Man, there's so much going on. Comic books right now. Holy cow, DC's just done a, a major announcement <coughs> announcing they're doing this new kind of <coughs> situation where they are going to be doing a series of um, oversized prestige format one shots going over like their 80 year history. Like the oversized like this? Or um, you mean oversized thickness? Like thick. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know what, actually I haven't seen anything yet, but I'm gonna assume it's sure. just the, like, Not the, like a treasury edition. And things like that. It's gonna mm -hmm. go throughout their history. It's gonna kick off with the free comic book day nice. book on uh, first Saturday in May. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it'll be, I think a monthly, but it's gonna be like the heroic age mm -hmm. and it'll be, you know, the golden age and their heroes and are they kind like of that. Are they trying to like reestablish a canon of some kind? That's what we don't know. One of the things that struck <clears> me <throat> as uh, interesting though, as I'm reading over the whole like, you know, the coming of the heroes right. and their superhero lines, which is I think uh, the second, first or second one. We don't really know what's in the free sure. comic book day one yet. Sure. So that might just be an overall view of things. But they mentioned the JSA a lot. They mm -hmm. mentioned Alan Scott. They mentioned a lot of the golden age characters, mm -hmm. which if you've been following from Rebirth up now through the Heroic Age, or whatever they're calling, Heroic Age was Marvel actually, but uh, Rebirth through Heroes Reborn. Um, we haven't seen those characters, they've just been gone. Mm -hmm. They've mentioned them a couple of times. We've started to see um, little bits and pieces and hints of them, but you know, overall big stories with them, we haven't seen that yet. And these are beloved characters, mm -hmm. characters that have you know, stood the test of time. These are the characters that kicked DC really off into the superhero vein right. back in the 40s. So very excited to see that. I know fans have been um, clamoring for this for like the last seven or eight years. Uh, we haven't seen these characters in the limelight after, you know, they just had a good long run of the JSA series. Mm -hmm. So very excited about that. We'll see what happens. And then there's titles such as the Metahumans, which I'm going to guess is going to be about their superhero stuff from the 80s somewhere in that era. Mm -hmm. There's about one about the crisis. Then I think there's one about the modern era. So it's gonna be interesting to see what these are gonna be and if they're going to use these to lay new groundwork. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we went 52 issues with the first one when they uh, you know, rebirthed mm -hmm. and then they stopped them and everything went back to zero. Mm -hmm. Now we're into uh, the new version. And so we'll see if maybe this is gonna be used to do another jump on point or another reset or something odd like that. And mm -hmm. wouldn't put it past DC and to do a big build up like this, or it really could just be a couple of cool one shots that are gonna be a little pricey and you know, hopefully appeal to fans who you know, may have dropped off and oh, you know, finally some characters I like are back and mm -hmm. they, they pick it up. So hmm. we'll see how that goes. Cool. Have you read any comics or you just not been reading a lot of comics? I read, through, I read through the, the Dawn of X and all that, the X stuff, House of X and, okay. and uh, Power of X, 10, whatever. I read through those and then kind of stopped, you know, I, and I read like the first three issues of each of those new series, I think, and sure. then, uh, but none of it really grabbed me, grabbed me, so. All right. You can have those back. Okay. <laughs> Out recently, we've had uh, from Titan Comics, Adler, which is a uh, female character-centric version of your Holmes mm. kind of uh, character, so a Holmesian pastiche. All female characters, so Holmes meets League of Extraordinary Gentlemen mm -hmm. with an Irene Adler character, a Jane Eyre style character, um, like Lady Havisham from your uh, uh, Charles Dickens uh, stuff is in there, mm -hmm. um, and some other characters. Great art, good story, uh, sometimes maybe a little, a little heavy on the uh, snark uh, compared to some other stuff, but overall really worth checking out. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend it, good art whole thing's well done. <coughs> Boom, we get Alienated, which is a brand new number one. Great art throughout this entire thing. Mm -hmm. Really, really well done with actual backgrounds and wow. stuff. Like somebody was not phoning it in. Mm -hmm. I've seen so many books now from smaller publishers that the artists are just doing, you know, basically portraits anymore. Right. And there is no attention to any kind of detail. This breaks the mold. This has a lot of great detail. Chris Wild Goose is uh, the artist and is just something to really keep uh, your eyes on. Story's really interesting. Uh, a couple teenagers are on their way to school. They miss the ride, they miss the bus, they something. Mm -hmm. They're not friends, they don't know each other. <clears throat> and they all end up walking through these woods at about the same time. And they come across this odd thing in the woods. And all of a sudden, 
they're a little connected in a way that they can hear each other's thoughts from wherever. Sounds like a D&D campaign. Um, it's all uh, New World. It's all very recent um, social media type aspects mm -hmm. and um, three different personalities of the teenagers. Really well done. Characters seem to be uh, thought out well and uh, put together. whole thing was uh, really good. And then, because I believe we're going to be talking about Birds of Prey today. Sure. They put out a black label Harley Quinn Birds of Prey oversized uh, book. Black Label uh, is an offshoot of DC's stuff, and it allows them basically to do rated R comics. Hmm. Uh, you know when you see the Black Label that this is not for uh, children, and in it you're going to get all kinds of stuff. This primarily is uh, going to give you a lot of cursing and some violence mm -hmm. to the point where you're like, oh, you wouldn't normally see uh, the Huntress put a crossbow bolt through a guy's face. Sure. And in this, you will get to see that sort of thing. Or decapitations. Mm -hmm. um, no, uh, some implied sexual things, lots of jokes about sex, but mm -hmm. no actual sex. Sure. Jimmy Palamati, uh, Amanda Con or Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palamati are the team behind this with uh, Amanda and Jimmy doing the writing, Amanda doing the art. They've done the series off and on for quite some time. They're the ones that have kind of taken it in that really fun uh, uh, Deadpoolish, silly jokes and stuff like that kind of way. I have not read their stuff before. Hasn't really appealed to me. Harley Quinn's not a character that I traditionally follow. This is damn funny. I laughed an awful lot. There's a lot going on. Good. And for a $5.99 book, which really compared to other books isn't that uh, crazy, it's a long read. They did not skimp on anything in this book. There's a lot going on. You're going to get Harley Quinn. You're going to get Huntress. You get Poison Ivy, you get Cassandra Kane, all in the same book. Um, I don't really remember anything with, uh, oh, Renee Montoya at the very end, but I don't really remember anything with Black Canary in this first issue, so I assume she is going to show up later. That is your comic uh, segment of the week, which I think uh, leads us right into Birds of Prey the movie. Well, the one thing about that book right there is those characters have costumes on. Yes, they okay. Do. And uh, nobody, with the exception of maybe Harley, had a costume on in uh, Birds of Prey, the movie that we saw last week. And I really, really was disappointed in that movie. I didn't have any high hopes for it to begin with, but uh, I was right on track. I was, <laughs> I was right. How's that? <laughs> I know, it's hard to believe. Uh, so, yeah, the movie itself was, was just so scatterbrained and... Um, didn't have any of the things that appealed, I think, to modern comic audiences. You know, sure appealed to girls or women power or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm all pro all that stuff, but you still gotta make a good movie. Just because you make a, a movie that's important for whatever social reason doesn't mean that it gets passed. It still has to be a good movie, and it wasn't a good movie. That's just what I think. I thought there was some costumes uh, within the thing. I just think that the costumes were incredibly poorly done. They didn't look good, and you and me have seen better costuming at bad cosplay contests than what we saw in that show. Uh, so bad to the fact that you're saying you don't even think they were costumes. Right. Huntress was wearing something. I don't know. Maybe some black leather. It, it looked like crap. Um, Harley kind of wore the same kind of stuff you expected her to see in the Suicide Squad, which kind of a costume. She's kind of just built in with a costume because of the face makeup and the hair. Sure. You know, she, she's she got a striking look that you're like, oh, that's what she looks like. The uh, calling the little girl Cassandra Kane, huge mistake. She's not Cassandra Kane. I mean, obviously she is in this Marvel, or the Marvel, in this uh, cinematic universe that DC's putting together. But in the books, that is a completely different character. They could have just named her any other character and avoided that problem because she has nothing to do whatsoever with what is in the comic books for the character of that same name. Right. Now they might try to try in some background if they were to get a sequel. They won't get a sequel. But if they had, they could have done something with that aspect of it. Um, one of the things I liked was everybody's out to kill Harley and they give you a very clear explanation with visuals of why everybody is trying to kill Harley. Sure. Um, I got it. I thought that was really well done. I liked it. I thought that was fun. But overall, for me, the whole movie was just kind of a giant meh with some fun action scenes and a few good jokes here and there. But overall, calling it the Birds of Prey and that huge silly title didn't make any sense. It's not about the Birds of Prey whatsoever. They are 
all hangers on in the movie with them not even really becoming anything until the <clears throat> after credit uh, portion of the program practically with them actually being the birds of prey. Um, none of it really works really well. None of it's that interesting nor exciting. We're obviously not the target market, I would say. Uh, but, and here's my problem. This is, the, this is my big, big problem with this movie. You went out of your way to make this movie um, rated R. What was the point? It's language. There's nothing in this movie that a director or editor couldn't have got down to a PG-13 with minimal amount of effort, and then you would have got your target audience, which would have been tween age girls. Yeah. That's obviously who this thing really should appeal to, is that 11 to 23 year old market, with half of them being able to see the movie without a big problem, but the under half being those girls who have their Harley Quinn dolls and things like that, who are excited and want to see it. Now some could say, well, they did the same thing with Deadpool. <clears throat> My comment there is Deadpool earned his hard R. The violence, the sure. everything about that movie was rated R. This movie, mm -hmm. violence? I, I mean, there was a few things here and there, but it wasn't against a little bit of clipping, and that movie was a PG-13 without anybody losing you know, their integrity. I really feel like Harley is one of those characters that's just good in small doses, and is because the thing that makes her pop, the, the I don't know. Over the top zeniness. Yeah, that, you can't sustain that for two hours. You can't, you can't make me sustain that for two hours, okay? Uh, so that's why in Suicide Squad she works fine, because she's in and out, and in and out. She comes in, draws, drops a line, is she's back out and but something like this is is just not uh, that's not a that's not a main character character sure. to me box office wise uh, looks like it's coming in currently for week one at about 20 million dollars below um, US North American uh, box office estimates yeah that's a huge huge dump they have then turned around in the second <clears throat> week and most theaters have taken the new name that was given out from the studio. So within one week, they've changed the name from Birds of Prey and the Emancipation blah, blah, blah to Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey, right. which is really what it should have been all along anyway. The thing is, is like I was watching an interview and they're like, yeah, we thought that was really funny. Well, if, th if funny was worth the 20 million at the box office, I man, that was a good joke, but now you're gonna have to pay for it. The truth is, is this movie is going to make back its initial filming budget of 80 some million dollars between North America and overseas. Mm. Is it going to make back its uh, extended budget of uh, probably a hundred million dollars in marketing? No way in hell. There's no way that by the time the bean counters get done with all the stuff that they take into consideration, yeah. that this movie is going to make them any cash. And that means we're not going to see a sequel. Yeah. Uh, unless we see some kind of cult following but I then again, see. Suicide Squad didn't really pick up that cult following, right. so I don't see this movie uh, picking up that sort of. Uh, and I don't think there's any. Th I don't think the only thing that has going for it. I don't think there's anything coming out in the next few weeks that's going to, you know, really jump all over the box office. Um, so it might have a little bit of staying power there, staying in the top two or three for a little bit. But it's just um, it didn't. You know, opening weekend is everything for these people yes. because we talk about opening weekend and, and people who report on things talk about opening weekend and that sets the tone whether or not somebody who's on the fence with it will actually go see it or not. Um, it definitely doesn't have a, a second viewability. Um, it's just, yeah. And, and uh, that's disappointing. It's disappointing because, you know, we want stuff like that to su succeed and and uh, for whatever reason. Yeah, I mean, I didn't do. go into this. I went into this thinking from the previews and the trailers, I went in thinking, Eh, this doesn't look very good. Right. What I was really hoping for was to walk out of it going, wow, that yeah. really surprised me. They, right. they held some stuff back. Yeah. That really did do a great job. And instead, I walked out. You walked out, I think, disappointed. Yeah. I walked out, meh. Um, but, and I also, I went out of my way to look up like what was coming out this week to see mm -hmm. if it could have a strong second week, possibly. Mm -hmm. And we've got a Will Ferrell movie with um, the... Seinfeld uh, female lead. Uh, Julie Louis Dreyfus. Julie, thank you. Um, whether that's going to like do power at the box office or not, I don't know that he's been hitting that. Will Ferrell's been really knocking him out of the park lately. Um, plus, throughout a lot of the country, it's cold. Yeah, It's so cold that I don't know that people are... I think Netflix is about to have a really good weekend <laughs> because like people are staying in yeah. and they're going to watch some television this yeah. week. So... I don't see it doing anything. If it were to make 
If it were to make another 18 million this week in the U.S. North American box office, mm -hmm. I'll be surprised. Yeah. That's where I'm going. So. That's our uh, our coverage of Birds of Prey. Okay. Hey, speaking of uh, the DC Universe, uh, they put out a very short camera test uh, type shot of uh, the new Batman, the Robert Pattinson Batman. Uh, um, not a whole lot there, just some, you know, uh, very dark, hard to see imaging. Uh, the only thing people are really taking out of it is the, the chest piece with the gun in it and how that's a... Is there a gun in it? Well, apparently, so your Detective 1000 that came out, okay. Jim Lee and or Kevin Smith apparently incorporated into that a little new bit of I don't know, lore in which Batman takes the gun that killed his parents and either melts it down or whatever and puts it into his chest piece. Oh, okay. And so that is what is seen in, um, in, the, test in, the, in the thing we saw today. I, I thought that was, I didn't know that. I thought that was like a batarang yeah. kind of a thing where he would be able to take it off and throw it, rip it out in you know, an emergency yeah. situation yeah. and be able to use it as a bat tool. Right. Um, I, I know you hate hearing it because I bring it up all the time. I am a little colorblind. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> as I was watching it, mm -hmm. I'm like, Am I not seeing stuff? Because it yeah. was no. It was the first three or four seconds. All I saw was black, and yeah. then eventually it pans up. So to say it was a costume camera test, I felt was a little a little BS -y. It was a chest up shot of him with the emblem yeah. and a side view, partial view of the mask. Overall, I thought it looked pretty good. The comments that I've seen from people who seem to follow this sort of thing is. It seems very reminiscent of the video game Arkham Asylum style Batman mm -hmm. costumes right now. Yeah. Um, my thinking is, is all you saw was the emblem, which did look different, mm -hmm. and you saw, you know, the face. Right. Well, the truth is, is anybody with a decent chin can make that cow look good. Yeah. It's very, you know? it's very angular. It's very different. I wish at some point. I think, I think Affleck's suit was probably the closest we've come to a guy in tights. You know, where yeah, there was muscles and stuff in there, but. It wasn't armor, you know. It, he wasn't trying to be uh, uh, Iron, Man. Iron Man, and and this looks like that again. So yeah. I don't know if I, I'm gonna like it or not. But th maybe okay. So camera test. Are they throwing stuff out there so early just to get reaction from people so they can change things if they need to? Because they did show just a little bit. You saw this, and that's it. So uh, is that a precautionary thing, or are they trying to you know re-energize people about DC after? After uh, Harley Quinn didn't do so good, I don't know. It just seemed kind of an out of the box, out of out of out of place. Let's just throw this teaser out there. I think it's a little bit of everything you just said. Oh, One, I don't think the the DC universe with this movie Birds of Prey is super thrilled with what just happened. Mm -hmm. And the other thing with that is, is there's they mention Batman, Bruce Wayne, and the Joker throughout that entire movie. Yeah. Not a single cameo, not a single peek at any of them, yeah. not even like a shadowy figure. So that was a little disappointing. They had an animated Joker at the beginning. Did they? I yeah. didn't remember that. When she was talking about breaking up with him. Okay. Yeah. And then secondly, yes, get out ahead of it. See, you know, Sonic the Hedgehog had the entire movie redone because <laughs> fans blew up. So get out ahead of it. But And I think the most important thing, though, is it's going to leak anymore. It's 100% going to happen. Yeah. Somebody's going to get some grainy, crappy photos, yeah. and they are going to be all over the internet. So anymore, let's just get ahead of it. We'll release our own high quality grainy photos <laughs> and that way we will control the narrative now if he's ever seen again as he's walking from a car or whatever to a set and somebody mm -hmm. grabs some pics that won't have any kind of merit now mm -hmm. other than it, well we got the full look i wouldn't be shocked if in the next couple of months or even weeks we don't see a full um, head to toe um, look at it yeah. even if it's still dark just to, again the internet and social media at this point is yeah. everywhere. I'm guessing they're getting ready to do some outside filming and uh, know that stuff like that's going to happen. So that's probably what's going to happen. Get ahead of it. Jump ahead of it. Have you been watching uh, Lock and Key at all yet? We have. We are two and a half episodes in. Okay. We just, we just started last night. So one of the things I've heard from people, and I'd be curious, you, did you think that uh, the first one was a little slow? Um, a little, sure. Yeah. Sure. I thought the first... I hear that because I've heard so because I'm telling them, oh, I really like it. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, really? I thought it was slow. I'm mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, the first half of the first episode's slow yeah. because they have to introduce like right. characters and stuff, and right. they did so in a way that felt fairly organic and, and worked. And then by the second episode, I'm like, we're up and running. Right. So here's the only thing I don't like about this show so far. I, I, very curious because me and Nick have talked about this. It's how 
nonchalant they are about the fact they have this magic crap in the house all over the place, okay? Okay. Like, all of a sudden, nobody's, they're going to school, okay? <laughs> they're just going to school and going throughout their day. And, oh yeah, by the way, I put a key in the back of my neck, okay? So, so that's not something we're going to talk about. We're just going to do it and accept it, and that's the way it is. And, uh... Um, we have a, we had a mirror dimension thing where we had to throw a rope and bring some back. And is that really mom that came back through with with the kid? We don't we don't know that. That could be that could be mirror mom. I'm not really sure. But it's just how how quickly acceptant they are of this whole key and key and such key situation. And uh, they don't really talk about it. They, that's not. We would have meetings. Okay. Oh, yeah. We would have family meetings. About, what are we gonna do? <laughs> okay. So I don't know. That's that's. Just, one of the things we, this is, you, you know me, I hate, when we go to the movies, I get, mm. I get really ticked at you because you look at your phone. Sure. This is one of the few times where during the episode I talk, uh -huh. I question things. Me and my wife have a discussion during the episode. We do that. Because so much stuff's happening. <coughs> Most shows I'll wait till the end and I'm like, hey, did you catch this or that? This mm -hmm. time I'm like, no, no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. Secondly, so the, the, for those, because we always just jump into these things, family, father's lost, he's not lost, father's murdered, family ends up taking over an ancestral home on the other side of the country. Right. We go from Seattle to uh, Massachusetts, Maine, sure. somewhere like that. Yeah. So completely across the country, kids are uprooted to this old house that he's owned forever, him and his family, but they never talk about. Mm -hmm. Turns out it's a mysterious house, it's magical, and there are magic weird keys mm -hmm. that each key does something odd. Mm -hmm. um, I almost felt a little like, oh, what was that one with all the objects in the hotel room? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. The store, yeah. store, not storage. I love that show. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, felt like that where the keys do the same kind of thing. Right. You do some of the key, something happens with it. But what drove me up the wall is there's a kid, the youngest of the family, named mm -hmm. Bodie. Mm -hmm. How the hell old is this kid? Because he is young enough to have the imagination to like thoroughly play with toys. Right. Not just like, po like he is playing right. with his toys. He's got a great imagination. Right. But on the other hand, mom has absolutely no problem leaving him alone in a house and going to town yeah. for him when she knows that there is a cliff that is within walking distance, a well that seems to be some deadly thing that he snuck into and she knows it. Yeah. And he just, again, has the imagination of this child that seems to like, he doesn't seem to have um, the normal barriers that most kids would have of fear. Yeah. This kid seems to be fearless but not in the interesting, cool way. Right. Just, what is up with this kid? Yeah, I don't know. It's me and Nick are just like, like, how old is he supposed to be? Why is he allowed to do all this crap? What, he's like, because I'm guessing that that kid is supposed to be Owen's age, which is Nick's kid who's been yeah. on the show a couple times. Maybe. I think that's about the right age. I've seen Owen play with his toys. I know how he thinks. Yeah. Owen finds some strange key. He is not putting it in the back of his head. Right, that's weird. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. He's gonna take it to mom and dad, or something like that. Um, I don't know how strong this Bodhi kid is, uh -huh. but when you can open a bear trap that it would take two lumberjacks to open, yeah, that, that kid has got mutant powers. That was ridiculous. So I love the show. I love talking about it. It's got a lot of cool aspects. It feels like a little bit of a watered down or uh, less suspenseful version of the House on Haunted Hill mm -hmm. kind of a vibe to it. Uh, with that sort of thing going on and the family and all that. Mm -hmm. So I really like it. I make that show much more suspenseful and stressful in my mind mm -hmm. than what they put on the actual film itself. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh, is this about, and, right. oh, and, and it's like, oh yeah, oh, we're gonna go to school now. So some great stuff going on with it though, bashing it a little bit because that's easy to talk about. Whereas the look of the show, the house, my wife wants the house. Yeah. If the house is up oh. for sale and we hit the lottery, she wants the house. That's too much work. Man. So that's a lot of work. If you own the house, you can probably hire you know the people to take care of the house. That's always my thing. I guess. I don't want an in-ground swimming pool, Mike, unless I can afford the people right. to take care of the in-ground swimming pool. Right. So cool stuff. Yeah. We got a couple minutes left. What do you want to touch on? Um, What's on that list that you're excited about? Uh, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm gonna... Everybody. Oscars just happened, a lot of cool stuff, exciting things. I just want to tell the world, me and Mike had a, a, a gentleman's <laughs> oh, wager right. about who was going to win best original screenplay. Mm -hmm. I swore up and down that this was Quentin Tarantino's thing, because mm -hmm. I didn't think he was going to get Oscars in anything else. I thought he was going to get snubbed, right. but they would give him this because writing is his thing, right. and they love it. Instead, Mike said that it was going to go towards uh, Parasite, Mike was right. Yes. I lost the bet. Yes. I'm going to give him a check for a dollar. Woohoo! I'm going to frame it. It's going to be awesome. 
Um, I had a pretty good. I had a pretty good Oscar. You really season. did. I did. Uh, now, did you just do this on your own, or did you do some research? I'm oh, curious. I did research. Okay. I research. I, I never do any research. <clears throat> well, because I haven't seen everything. You know. Okay. Even I mean, me I, hasn't seen everything. Gotcha. You know, so it's hard to say. Was there a big surprise? Uh, yeah, the big um, the big upsets were uh, Parasite for Best Picture and Best Director. Those were those were thought to, for sure to go to Sam Mendes in 1917. That was my pick, Sam Mendes in 1917. Uh, even odds makers were right there. So um, having not seen Parasite, like 90% of the country, I can't say. I really hope a lot of the a lot of the uh, Oscar voters saw Parasite. I hope they did anyway. Um, but hey, I'm all for it. Uh, you know, whatever barriers or breaks or language language uh, firsts we have on everything. If it's a good movie, it needs it needs to be it needs to be the winner. I haven't seen it, so I can't say. <sighs> Parasite. Who saw Parasite? Stop it. Did you see Parasite? No. So yeah, that was a great but video. I'm not, but I'm, I'm glad voter. that you shared it with me because I was like oh, I was just cringing the entire yeah. time. There's some video out there of a guy just. Internet meltdown losing yeah, it. Yeah. To, sometimes you have to even wonder, is this real anymore or are people just doing it? But he wow. and as much as he said, I don't you know, that he wasn't, you know, trying to make the Joker be the better movie, he was talking about the Joker oh, yeah. through the entire oh, I thing. Talked about so it. you could tell he was a real fanboy oh, and like, it, it oh. was and I was just worried, like you said, I was worried that they were gonna try to make this kid famous for being such an idiot oh, because yeah. uh, don't do it. We, we we have enough of that. Quit making that. stupid people famous. Yeah. Just, Stop but it, doing the it. Oscar telecast itself was it wasn't bad. It went a half hour over, uh, but it's it wasn't not bad it, compared to what it has in the past. It wasn't horrible. <laughs> yeah, no, no host. They really no no host, but they really didn't try to get people to make their forty five second speech. You know, especially the big ones. Anyway, I only saw them, they put the lights down once, and it was on somebody for you know sound or whatever. You're a nobody. Get yeah. off the stage. Right. But they let people go, and those people took advantage of it. Some of them made. You know, three and four minute speeches, and so, you know, it was, but it was a good show, and uh, I think a lot of the things that were supposed to win won, and, and uh, I was very happy Jojo Rabbit won for best. I, uh, I really want to see that. I really want to see that. My favorite movie, mm -hmm. and I have not seen Parasite. I did see Hollywood. I saw Jojo. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen 1917 yet, but oh, I will. Oh, it's good. It's good. I'll definitely see it. But yeah. yeah, Jojo for me was the movie of the year. Mm -hmm. um, very excited about that. So uh, my only disappointment was in lead actress. Um, I saw, we, uh, Casey and I did see Judy uh, with Renee Zellweger, and she was great. She was amazing. She, she transformed herself, for sure. I just felt like Scarlett Johansson in The Marriage Story was, was the, best, the best performance of the year. Gotcha. Other than that, I was okay with everything. She got stuff twice. Yeah. She was but she was also in the two big categories. That's, yeah. I don't know how often that happens, so know. that's pretty freaking cool. But, yeah. And I will tell you, after seeing her in Jojo Rabbit, mm -hmm. I, I have a new respect for Scarlett Johansson. I... Haven't seen her in a lot of stuff that hasn't been action and Avengers right. or you know stuff like that. Watch a, um, she blew me away in this. Marriage Story is her and Adam Driver, and it's both it's a straight drama about a family kind of breaking up and dealing with divorce, and, and they have a kid and everything, and it's just really really good, and they are amazing in it. Very cool. Yeah. All right, everybody, we're over time. I don't know how they filmed this or put it together, so it's on somebody else's. Cut it down. Hey, be groovy. Don't forget, stop by Geek Street and give us some money. We need it. <laughs>